Hey everyone, so I know it's been a while since I've done anything related to my top 50, and because of that, uh, let's just say, uh, uh, since I've done my top even 100, my, my, my opinions have fairly changed on a lot of movies, and it's kind of been all over the place at this point, and in like the next three months, this is probably going to change, but yeah, this is going to be my top 50 video. The reason why I'm not recording with my camera is because I would be switch probably accidentally switching the camera angle so many times and switching shirts so many times, your eyes would probably start to hurt, and I need viewers. So, uh, yeah, let's just get into this, and let's get into my top 50. I won't be going all uh, very heavily over all of these. Some of these will be quite brief uh, because it's, it's 50 minutes, and I don't want this to be, like, double that. I don't want this to be double 50 minutes, so yeah, let's just get into the video. Number 50, The Last Crusade. Honestly, I don't have a ton to say about this film besides the fact that it's a really well-made Spielberg blockbuster. Now, I used to think that this was better than the first, and while I don't agree with that now, it's definitely close. I think, if anything, it does what a sequel should do. It expands the whole world and idea of Indiana Jones and makes it more interesting with a new adventure and a new goal. Also, with Sean Connery, who has great chemistry with Harrison Ford really buy their disconnected relationship. On top of that, it also is just a really fun adventure that you can sit back, relax, and watch. And while this is definitely not nearly one of the greatest films ever made, I don't think that's what Spielberg was trying to do. I think he was just trying to make a fun time. Number 49, The Dead Zone. While this isn't my favorite Stephen King movie, trust me, we'll see more than just this, it's definitely one of my favorites. Christopher Walken's character is definitely the main thing to point out about this movie. He really just embodies himself into this broken, depressed loner who lost everything in his life. After losing everything in his life, he feels isolated and alone and gave up on even trying to get his life back, and in sort of a way comes to term with everything at the end by sacrificing himself and saving millions of lives because of the fact that he lost everything. This is probably one of the best performances from a Stephen King movie, and while it's not my favorite Stephen King movie, it's certainly up there. Number 48, Vertigo. I watched this film very recently, and it kind of just gave us everything we love and know Hitchcock for. But with that said, I definitely have issues with this, so I'll get those out of the way. First off, this is a somewhat small problem, but Scotty's former fiancé didn't need to be in the movie. And I get that she's supposed to, I guess, show that he failed I love or something like that. But she shows up for a couple of scenes that we don't really need to have. And even though she seems to really care about him, she in, in, when he's in a bad state, he just kind of leaves him. And I guess disappears for the whole movie. Also, I am trying as hard as I can not to spoil this, but there's a certain thing that happens that isn't explained very well. I know it's not specific, but if I told you, it would spoil the movie. And there's probably some people that have watched the movie that know what I mean. But besides that, this film is fantastic. I've seen Jimmy Stewart in a couple of other films, but this definitely is the best I've ever seen from him. You have no idea what's going on most of the time, and you're just as confused and tense as he is throughout a lot of the runtime. You can also tell how he really cares for this woman, and how desperately he wants to be with her, and that just makes the ending all the more shocking and powerful. Also, this is Hitchcock's best shot film. There are these fantastic long takes that happen throughout the film, and these sort of trippy dream sequences in the film that are amazingly shot. Also, when we get that twist and everything comes together, wow. Number 47, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Honestly, I don't have much to say about this film. It's just a great time with a great score. It's a very adventurous film, and I really love the settings as well as the score. It's just a great adventurous fun time. There isn't a ton to say about this movie as much as I love it. I definitely do need to rewatch it, but honestly, if I did rewatch it, I wouldn't have much to say. It's fun, and it's pretty well made at the same time. Not one of the greatest films ever made, kind of like Last Crusade, but it's pro it's pretty much the greatest adventure movie ever made. I don't think there's much of a denial for that. I mean, yeah, it's psycho. What else do you want me to say? This is my favorite Hitchcock film, and I know very original of me, but it deserves it. Anthony Perkins, of course, does a phenomenal job as Norman Bates. He seems like such a nice guy, but you can always feel something off about him as well. Also, that score is iconic. It's so eerie and uncomfortable. I know I'm not explaining my love for this movie very much, but I mean, do I need to? It's psycho. Number 45, Return the Jedi. If you know me at all, then you know that this is my favorite Star Wars movie, and honestly, I might even consider it technically the best. 
People say this is the most flawed, but I hardly even hear anyone explain why it's the most flawed. And I don't have much wrong with this film. It pretty much has the most unique opening in Star Wars, sort of giving us an idea of what the crime world is like in Star Wars. Like, how can you not love that? The space battles are pretty much the best in the series. Since the first two made a ton of money, they were able to go more grand with the special effects and the budget. But the main reason why I love this film is its phenomenal payoff to all three. Or you can include the prequels, which that would be six. People forget to acknowledge how great of a conclusion this is. Even though the Empire wasn't exactly fully defeated, it still feels satisfying because Darth Vader was supposed to be the chosen one, and he sacrificed himself to defeat Palpatine, which makes sense now because Darth Vader bought, brought ba balance to the Force, which later was messed up in a certain movie, but we don't talk about it. This film is just so grand and cinematic, and honestly, I really respect and love it for that. Number 44, Paths of Glory. I don't think many people can deny this was Kubrick's first great film. The tracking shots in this movie are beautiful. We get to see pretty much everything that's going on, and when we see these tracking shots, it's amazing. It's also one of the best paced movies I've ever seen. It builds up the terrible inevitable in such a slow way, and I love it. But the best part about this film is how it shows the dangers of war. It really shows us the sad, brutal reality that war really is, and even though many of us know it, this is true, it shows it in an even harsher light, and because of that, it's one of the best war films ever made. 43, Inside Out. This is my favorite Pixar movie, meaning it's the only one in my top 50, and while I know that it has flaws, and that it's probably the most flawed film on this list, it's a very personal movie to me. Well, yes, I do very much admire its creativity. I think the way it talks about emotions is why I love this film. It's a film that tells us that our emotions are normal to feel and that none of them are bad, and feeling angry or sad is perfectly normal. And you should never fight it, which is a great message. Well, yes, you can critique its flaws, and it's probably not even in the top five best Pixar movies. It's still my favorite. Number 42, Batman. While well, once again another flawed movie in my favorites list, I still consider it as one of the greatest comic book films ever made. First off, Danny Elfman's score is the only Batman score, and even haters of this film can't deny it. When I think of Batman, I think of the score. Michael Keaton and Jack Nicholson are both phenomenal in their roles, and really have a fantastic rivalry. The atmosphere is also phenomenal. The way Gotham looks is just like nothing else, which is built up by the score, visuals, and scenery. It gets the atmosphere of Gotham perfectly. Number 41, The King of Comedy. This is my second favorite Scorsese film. You will see another one much higher. One of the best things about this movie is it gets stuck in your head. I haven't seen it since last November, and yet I can remember practically every single thing that happens. While I love Robert De Niro, Goodfellas' performance in this film is 10 times better. In fact, I forgot this was Robert De Niro most of the film. That's how deep he is into the role. You really buy him as this crazy guy who thinks that he's the best comedian in the country. It's also a movie where you can interpret the ending how you want to. You can think he actually escaped him and he became successful, or that he stayed locked up for longer and everything ended up worse for him. It's also an insane fun ride. I was shocked with how much fun I was having. While not my favorite Scorsese movie, definitely one of the more interesting ones. Number 40, Rushmore. This is my favorite Wes Anderson movie and is the first movie where I felt like Wes Anderson found his style. But just looking at it as a film, I still love it. Jason Schwartzman is someone that is insanely flawed, that makes tons of mistakes, but at the end of the day is a character you feel really bad for, and love him for how determined he is. Bill Murray did a great job. Honestly, he's not really comedic in this film at all. He's more of a broken and flawed character. The chemistry between these two is great. They both do things they really regret, and at the beginning, they hate each other. They're also very similar at the same time. The cinematography and editing is great. Wes Anderson, very early on in his career, knew what he was doing. This is a simple drama, and I love it. Number 39, Justice League. Yes, another film on here that's far from perfect, but to be honest, it was just great seeing Zack Snyder doing these characters justice. We call this film Zack Snyder's Justice League when really it's the only Justice League. Yes, yeah, Superman is still ah. Yes, Wonder Woman isn't very good. Yes, the CGI is horrible. But honestly, there is so much that is good about this film that I don't even care. First off, Cyborg and Flash were done practically perfect. Many people say Cyborg was the best by far, but honestly, I think Flash was a close second. Unlike the fan film, they actually have development for these characters. Even Stefan Wolf has character in this. Also, the camera work is so gorgeous and lifelike. It's dark, but at the same time, beautiful. Honestly, as a comic book fan and a Zack Snyder fan, I couldn't ask for more. Number 38, Big Eyes. 
Honestly, this is a film that shows that Tim Burton still has it. It's very different from his other stories, and yet it still honestly works. Amy Adams does a great job in this movie. She's someone that you really want to make it to the top and be successful. The cinematography is also great and unique for Burton. The way he uses color in this film is very impressive. I also like the concept. I think it's something interesting and new that we never see from Tim Burton. Christopher Waltz, for the most part, did a good job, but I will admit he was kind of over the top as the film went on but overall it's honestly a really great film while not one of the best movies ever made once again it's a movie i absolutely love number 37 frankenstein this was one of the first horror films i've ever watched i'm glad it is honestly i love the uncomfortable atmosphere it creates it's so dark and uncomfortable and i love it for that of course boris karloff gives a phenomenal performance as frankenstein he really just embodies him completely you fear him but in a way you also feel bad for him at the same time and that's what makes him such an interesting character also i just absolutely adore frankenstein's design it's so iconic and just memorable this movie lives and breathes as a classic horror film that is somehow insanely suspenseful without needing a note to be dense. Number 36, 16 Candles. Honestly, this is just an entertaining movie and not much more than that. I will say this is probably the funniest John Hughes movie I've seen, either this one or Ferris Bueller, but even then it's just a fun ride. It takes sort of these stereotypes in high school movies and just has fun with it. And overall, because of that, I love it. It's a fun film with a clever sense of humor. Number 35, Sweeney Todd. For a while, this was my favorite musical, which it isn't now, but I still love it. The cinematography is honestly fantastic. The way the camera moves sometimes, it's honestly amazing. And the dark color grading looks beautiful. The songs are also great and very creative. Every song is interesting, especially the barber and his wife song. That one honestly hits hard. It's also interesting how over the top but yet tragic this movie is and how well it blends these two tones together. It's an insanely heartbreaking story that makes you sad, but at the same time, it can be this just campy, gory, over the top, fun movie and still work. Love it or hate it, there's nothing else out there like it and for that I love it. Number 34, V for Vendetta. Honestly, the way V is portrayed is very well done. Well, yes, V is portrayed as the hero in this movie. It's not as if we're supposed to support everything he does because sometimes some of the stuff he does is very messed up. But at the same time, you know the people running the government aren't the best people either, so you mostly root for him. Hugo Weaving's performance as him is honestly stellar. He just embodies this sort of crazy guy that does drastic things, but still knows what's right and isn't afraid to stand up for it. Natalie Portman in this film is fantastic. She's our lens into V's life and really feel the pain and love she has for V and the love that V had for her back. There's no cliche part where he takes off his mask and he ex and she accepts who he is or anything like that. They keep it a secret which makes it much more interesting. Number 33, The Shining. Once again, it's another classic that everybody loves, but the main reason why I think this film works is the atmosphere. It's all so eerie, uncomfortable, and unique all at the same time. The cinematography in this movie is fantastic, which isn't a surprise since Kubrick is a master at camera work, but I personally think this is Kubrick's second best shot movie. Of course, not as great as 2001 when it comes to cinematography, but I mean, what is? Jack Nicholson also helps to make this movie feel so eerie. Every time he's on screen, he looks like he's just about to lose it, and when he does, his performance only gets better. This is an all-time classic that everybody knows why it's so amazing what is there more to say number 32 bride of frankenstein frankenstein i will say is probably the better horror movie but bride of frankenstein is the better overall film it still somewhat keeps the uncomfortable atmosphere the original had of course not as well done but it's pretty close to it and of course, Boris Karloff still giving a phenomenal performance. The main way this film is an improvement is we spend more time sympathizing with Frankenstein. We see more of the human side of him and we understand his worldviews a lot more. It's also a film that takes place right after the events of the first one and that somewhat comes into play when a friend of Victor's wants to make a monster and that all makes sense. The ending is a very heartbreaking when all frankenstein wants is for someone to love him but even when the bride that is made for him is still scared of him which honestly just gives the whole movie a bad taste in your mouth in a good way though this is one of the best sequels ever made and so many people overlook it as that if you haven't watched this film i highly recommend it even if you didn't like the original as much this is honestly better number 31 akira 
the world building in this movie is phenomenal, if anything. We don't know anything that goes on at the beginning, and then things just start happening right away in the film, and then we start to understand them as the film goes on. It's a great tactic for us to be interested in the world that you're showing us. The animation is also phenomenal. It's so gritty and raw, but also futuristic at the same time, and that's hard to capture. Akira is one of the greatest futuristic movies I've ever seen, and one of the greatest animated films I've ever seen. Number 30, The Lion King. I mean, come on, it's The Lion King. I think the best part about this movie is Simba's arc, from trying to run away from his problems and then deciding to face them, and then he redeems himself. The landscape to this film is just beautiful. I can't believe they made Africa look this gorgeous. Scar is one of the greatest villains ever, and probably the greatest Disney villain, because he's a different threat than most other Disney villains. He's someone that's very intelligent, and unlike other Disney villains as well, he, nat he didn't naturally come to power. He worked to get there. This is an all-time Disney classic, and if we're talking what is technically the best, it's this one. Number 29, Saving Private Ryan. Now, this is my favorite war movie in Spielberg film. It's once again a movie that isn't afraid to show how brutal war is, but I think this film does it different than Pass the Glory. While Pass the Glory shows how harsh the sergeants and leaders were to the soldiers, this film is more different and it's about how brutal wars can be. It's a movie that's insanely bloody, but for a reason, to show us what war is really like. Honestly, sometimes I forgot I was watching a movie, it looks that real. The cast is also phenomenal, especially Matt Damon and Tom Hanks. They also feel like real soldiers. It's a very gritty movie that is probably the most real war movie I've ever seen. Number 28, The Social Network. If anything, this film shows you can make any movie work. It's just how you execute it. The performances in this film are honestly amazing. Jesse Eisenberg and Andrew Garfield have phenomenal chemistry. You really buy the friendship they used to have and that it fell apart. When it does fall apart, it's depressing. They both disappeared into the roles as these characters. It's honestly stunning. The dialogue is perfectly written. Every single sentence is written so intelligently, and the delivery from our main leads also plays a key part in it. You really can buy that these two are geniuses that invented Facebook. It's also so insanely entertaining and rewatchable. It's just fascinating how a movie about Facebook is this fun. In the next 10 years, this will be an all-time classic and already sort of is. Number 27, Unbreakable. This is by an insanely large margin, my favorite Shyamalan movie. Now from what I've seen from Shyamalan, I don't hate his films, even The Village of Glass I just find okay, but this is very easily the best in my eyes. I think the main reason why this film works so much is because of Bruce Willis and Samuel Jackson. Both of them are complete mirror versions of each other that both can't hide away from what they are, good or bad. The whole theme ties into the twist which makes it necessary. I won't spoil the movie, but if anything, this shows no matter what you do, no matter what we try we can't control what we're made to be we still will become that thing it's a shocking reality to think about but when you do it's a scary feeling that number 26 goodwill hunting destiny. This film is just really well made, not much else to it. If anything, I think it's a very motivational movie about not trying to throw the life away, and, and if you have talents, you should use them, and no matter where you came from, you can achieve these goals. Matt Damon gives a great performance as someone who's really stubborn. There's not much else to say about it, it's just a great film. Number 25, Eraserhead. This apparently was Stanley Kubrick's favorite movie, and I can see why. It's just so atmospheric and interesting. While I don't understand a decent amount of what happens, it's also so interesting and captivating. The practical effects and visuals really help add to this weird environment that it displays. Interestingly enough, it does have some messages about fatherhood and parenting a child that's born different, which I didn't notice quite at first, but when my friend brought it up and I thought, yeah, it is somewhat hidden in this movie. Overall, it's a very experimental film that I love. Number 24, The Green Mile. I need to rewatch it, but I remember adoring it the last time I did watch it. It's really hard to really dissect this film because it's just really well made from what I remember. Tom Hanks gives a phenomenal performance in this film, as well as John Coffrey, who gives a great emotional performance, and he also won an Oscar, which was very well deserved. It's a very emotional, intriguing prison movie that is just really well made. And Number 23, Singing in the Rain. This is my favorite musical, and honestly, I couldn't have asked for more. It's such a fun movie, if anything. The plot is simplistic, but it lets us focus more on everything else instead. The scenery is just beautiful in this movie. It's so bright and Hollywood-like. It's such a bright and colorful movie. It's like being in a Hollywood dream. The musical numbers are also iconic for a reason. They are so nice and calm to me. 
they really do encapsulate this good vibe that it's trying to capture. The characters are filled with personalities, such as Cosmo, who's a great character filled with life and energy. I'm glad in this movie they don't use the bickering couple trope for too long. They use it for one scene, and after that, they actually build their relationship. You really can buy that they love each other by actually showing they love each other instead of just arguing most of the film. But packed onto all this, it's just a creative movie with the scenery I was talking about, also the dance choreography. They use objects such that are just lying around to their advantage. Like for example, when they're at a movie set during Make Em Laugh, Cosmo starts crashing into things and messing around with stuff on the movie set. Just things like that show a lot of time was put into this film, making it enjoyable and creative. Number 22, Barry Lyndon. This is my favorite Kubrick movie, and that's a surprise to me. Like many people, I don't really love period pieces, but this film is a massive exception. For a movie that's over three hours, it's so intriguing, which I think Barry Lyndon's character, the cinematography, and scenery play a key part in why this is the case. Barry Lyndon's arc is phenomenal, from being a boy who's idly in love with his cousin, to becoming a very rich and successful man and then losing it all. Barry does many wrong things in this movie, but that makes him feel more real. He's neither good or bad, he's just a human being that we're witnessing. He was terrible to his stepson and realized what he was doing was wrong at the very end and made a very selfless decision. It's a phenomenal arc and probably one of the best ever. The set designs are gorgeous. It all feels like the time period it's in so perfectly. Sometimes you'll think you're watching real footage from the 1700s. This isn't really because it's really dark and gritty like Saving Private Ryan and that's why it feels so real. It's just the scenery and lighting make it feel like it's real and make it feel like this time period. It's in my eyes the greatest Kubrick film and one of the greatest films ever made. Number 21, War for the Planet of the Apes. This is my favorite trilogy, and I couldn't have asked for a better conclusion. In this film, Caesar is an even more broken character. He lost his wife, and one of his children is gaining even more hatred for the humans as a result, giving him an even bigger reason to fight them. This film builds a connection towards Caesar, the connection that we end up building towards Caesar even more than we already have. While not all humans are bad, and they do end up murdering all of them at the end, good or bad, we still can't help but root for Caesar, even if his side isn't completely right. We know not all the humans deserve to die, because of everything that has happened to Caesar, we still can't help but root for him. Woody Harrelson seems like a generic villain at first, but then we end up actually getting a backstory for him, and we actually start to empathize with him as well. As odd as it sounds, it's a film that can kind of show that there isn't always a right side to war, which is stupid if you tell it to someone who hasn't watched the film, but when you actually dissect the film, it is really present. Number 20, Mento. This is one of the most underrated films ever made. Yes, it's known as a great Nolan movie, but I think it's one of the greatest films ever made. The idea of telling the film out of order is such an interesting idea that works insanely well. It's always so intriguing and captivating, you can't miss a single second or else you won't know what's going on, but at the same time, if you pay attention the whole time, it's not easy to get lost at all. It's not hard to follow as long as you pay attention. The twist at the end was surprising but makes sense, the way most twists should normally work and how a good Nolan twist is executed. It's a fascinating film that keeps you asking for more. Number 19, Stand By Me. This is, in my eyes, one of the best coming-of-age movies I have ever seen. I have a couple more above it, but this is definitely up there. The best way to explain this film is the older you get, the better the movie does, since it's a film looking back on yourself when you were younger. I'm 14 moving on into high school, and these are 11-year-old kids going into junior high, so in a way, this is a nostalgia fest for me. Not because I lived in the 80s, which I didn't, but because I knew kids like this when I was an 11-year-old kid. The performances in this movie are fantastic. Everyone acts like their age and gets their characters down perfectly. They could have, couldn't have gotten a better kid cast, because they all can handle acting like normal kids having fun, and even the emotional scenes as well. It's an emotional but heartfelt story about living your youth to the fullest and looking back and cherishing those moments. Maybe not technically top 20 films ever made, but it's a film I can relate to very much. Number 18, Aliens. This is another perfect example of a great sequel. It expands what the first movie does, not just because there's more aliens, but Ripley even has a better character. She has a goal she has to achieve. The action and tension, once again, are very well crafted, and Sigourney Weaver in this film is phenomenal. What can I say? It's a great movie. Number 17, Carrie. 
This was the first Stephen King movie, and it's still one of the best. Carrie is a character you just can't help but root for. She's someone who you can't help but sympathize with, since she seems that she can't be left alone, and people keep harassing her for no reason at all. She's an outcast you really feel bad for, and that you want to win and have a great life. The thing that makes the climax to Carrie so powerful is the build-up to it all. We know what's going to happen at the end. We know that Carrie will snap, which makes everything more heartbreaking. But because before she loses it, she actually seems once in her life to have a great time, and people seem to be somewhat accepting of her, and it seems to be going great for her, and we're so happy things are finally going away, and then everything in her life is thrown away in a millisecond. When they release the bucket onto her head, it's shown in slow-mo, which was the perfect way to show it. It adds to the uncomfortable inevitable we know is going to happen. We know there's nothing anyone can do about it, but at the same time, we don't want it to happen. We want Carrie to win, but we know that she can't. Number 16, About Time. This is probably the best celebration of life ever put into a film. Not exactly the best movie that tackles these themes, but the best celebration of life. This movie enlightened me to the idea of celebrating life, and even when times get hard, you should still live your life to the fullest. Part of the reason why it works is because it doesn't always show the good side of life. There are multiple bumps along the road, but the film teaches us that we should move beyond them and move past them and only move forward with our lives, which is a great message that in our society, we very much overlook. The soundtrack encapsulates the tone and message that the movie is trying to convey perfectly. The main couple have great chemistry, and you really buy that they both are just two normal people that genuinely love and care for one another. This is an underrated gem that deserves way more appreciation than what we give it. Number 15, Goodfellas. This is quite easily my favorite Scorsese movie, controversial I know, but this movie deserves all the praise it's given. I've heard some people say that they can't connect with the characters, but I don't see that as a bad thing. If anything, I think that's kind of a compliment. I love when Scorsese focuses on terrible people who can't empathize with really, because it makes them feel more real in a way. Because not everyone is a good person, there are a lot of terrible people in the world. Instead of having someone that's built to be a main character, we just happen to follow this guy and see him progress and become a crime lord. It's also so stylish. It's edited and shot in such a flashy way and I love it. I'm not always a fan of narration of movies, but this is some of the best usage of it. It really adds to the style and creativity of this film. It's a long movie, but never really boring in my opinion. They always find a way to keep you engaged into whatever Henry is doing. Henry himself also has a great character arc, even if it's not cha him changing for the greater good. In fact, it's quite possibly the opposite. It's interesting to see Henry progress in a w into a worse person as the film goes along, and to getting more power as the film goes along. It's an all-time gangster classic that everyone knows about, and everyone has at least heard the references. It's a film that's truly like nothing else. Number 14, Metropolis. This is by a long shot my favorite silent movie and probably the most well-known silent film if we're being honest. It honestly looks gorgeous. The cinematography and scenery really encapsulate the futuristic vibe the film is trying to go for. I also love how it isn't like a gimmicky future movie at all. It actually feels like something that could happen in the future. Of course, it didn't happen the time period it takes place in, but that doesn't even really matter. My point is, it doesn't feel dated because of how well done and timeless the cinematography and scenery are. The cinematography and scenery also separate the poor people and the rich people in a way, because where the workers live, the cinematography is much darker and not as clean, and the scenery also looks the part. While up at the top, it's more futuristic and advanced, and the cinematography is very clean and bright. It's an interesting distinction. The score is phenomenal. Every scene fits its tone perfectly too intense, too calm, and relaxing, it works very well. The characters, even though they have little dialogue, they act with excellence. John's son seems like a very young and curious boy discovering the darkness of the world along with us. We discover the horrors along with him about how the world really is, which if you think about it, around his age is what we all do. When we live with our parents after 18 years, and then we end up living by ourselves, that's when we start to discover the harsher side of the world. Of course, we don't all do that, but many of us do. Of course, we don't discover it to this extent, but we do somewhat discover it. Even though it's silent and some people might see that as a disadvantage, it really isn't. It still gives multiple layered plot lines that we can easily understand, as well as having something to say about the government system and how we treat people that aren't as wealthy. It's an amazing sci-fi movie that has gotten a lot of attention and deserves even more. Number 13, Your Name. 
I've talked about this movie multiple times, including I have a video essay on it, so I'll keep it brief. Of course, the highlight is the animation. It's so insanely gorgeous. The way they mix purple, blue, and yellow is phenomenal. It's an insane joy to look at. Also, I love the soundtrack to this movie. It can be insanely emotional at points. The concept is also very interesting. They do a lot with it. It's a movie that can easily confuse you if you don't watch it through and through, but if you focus on it as hard as you can, you get a phenomenal film. Number 12, The Dark Knight. I mean, it's The Dark Knight, what do you want me to say? No matter what I will say, it's probably already been said a million times, moving on. Number 11, The Thing. This is one of the greatest concepts for a horror movie ever. The idea that the thing can shape into anyone builds onto the tension. Because they don't know who it is and neither do we. The practical effects are probably some of the best ever. If there was any example that practical effects will always look better than CGI, this one is it. Sometimes the practical effects will be used in a way to shock or scare the audience and it's done very well. The score is iconic and it's one of the best ever made. It really adds to the mysterious atmosphere. It's an all-time classic horror movie that, while it isn't my favorite, is very close to that. Number 10, Ed Wood. This is a movie I have not talked about very many times, but I still love it. Johnny Depp does a great job at playing this very passionate man who loves films, but at the same time is insanely bad at making them, which is just sad because he's such a likable guy that we can't help but root for, that we want to win, but he just can't make movies very well. But at the end, we know the film he makes isn't famous for the wrong reasons. It's still a happy moment at the end because Edward got to make what he wanted to make. During the film, he keeps trying to please other people, but then decides that he wants to make what he wants to make and doesn't care what anyone else says. Overall, it's a very uplifting and inspiring film about not trying to please other people. Number 9, Whiplash. I will say, this is probably the most intense I've ever been during a film, and it's not even a horror movie, which is all because of J.K. Simmons. This guy can make you laugh, but also terrify you at the same time. I don't know how he does it, but he does. I think it's because sometimes he's sort of over the top in an odd sense, not exactly goofy, but just filled with so much rage it gets to a comedic point, but not really in a bad way, more of an intelligent way. Because even if sometimes you kind of laugh at how mad he gets, he's still terrifying, which is why we're so afraid for our main character. Because if he messes up even a little bit, he'll just snap, adding more tension to the film. Even if J.K. Simmons is phenomenal, he doesn't completely carry the movie. Miles Teller does a fantastic job as well. You really see how passionate he is about drumming and how desperately he wants to do it, and his willingness to sacrifice everything he wants to get what he wants, such as pushing people away so he can focus on his passion fully. And that is the main theme of this movie, showing that there is a sacrifice to success, that sometimes in order to reach your goal, you have to leave things behind, which is heartbreaking but also tr sadly true. This movie is also gorgeous, especially for its budget. It was only 3.3 million and it looks like 300 million. It looks gorgeous. It's an intense tale that shows sometimes you have to sacrifice everything to make it to the top. Number 8, Peter Pan. This movie is the only nostalgia biased one I have on here, which is mainly because I grew up on Disney movies, especially the Silver Age. But that's not the only reason I love it. It's just so entertaining. It's probably the most rewatchable film for me on this list, or at least up there, because I could put this on whatever I want and still be happy. The animation is also really good. The landscapes are animated very well and sometimes beautifully animated. Captain Hook is one of my favorite Disney villains. He's just so entertaining to watch, but also somewhat of a threat. Plus, the voice acting by him is fantastic. It's just such a delightful adventure besides that song with the Indians. Number 7, 12 Angry Men. I mean, it's 12 Angry Men, it's a classic. Of course, the best thing to praise about this film is the dialogue. It's a film that takes a simple premise, but then shows us there's a lot more complexities to it. Not in a pretentious way, but more in a captivating way to keep us all interested. We don't even know really any of the characters' names, and yet they're so memorable. It's a movie that many praise and that will forever be known as one of the best films ever made. Number 6, Grave of the Fireflies. One of the biggest hidden gems in cinema, if I'm being honest. This film, in my opinion, doesn't just show what Ghibli can do, but what can animation do. They're not just supposed to be kids' movies. It's animation. You can do whatever you want with it. Don't We shouldn't just box it in. But with that said, this is one of the most emotional movies I've ever seen. It's a movie that does nothing but tear you to pieces throughout the film. Even the ending is insanely unsatisfying, but that's also what makes the ending fantastic because of how depressing it is. The theme of this film is that sometimes you should ask for help, 
and not try to do things you can't handle, which is just not something that kids need to learn, but also adults, which makes sense because most kids probably can't watch this movie. Because Seda didn't listen to it, it leads to permanent consequences that leave the movie on its depressing note, which anything makes it more impactful. For everyone that hasn't seen it, I highly recommend it. It's on YouTube for free. Just look up Grab the Fireflies full movie and you'll find it. I do want to warn people though, as I have stated, it isn't a film you can just put on. You really have to be prepared for it. Number 5. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde this, while not the scariest horror movie I have seen, it's the most well made. Frederick March plays Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, you can't even tell he's the same person. I'm pretty sure he won some sort of Oscar for this, which was well deserved. His performance as Dr. Jekyll is very good, but his performance as Mr. Hyde is something else. He embodies what people think of him as, a psychotic, mean, bitter monster that you utterly hate, and he does a great job at playing that. The effects, mainly the makeup, were definitely ahead of its time back then and hold up pretty well even 90 years later. You could tell they spent a ton of time trying to get the look of Mr. Hyde right. The cinematography and editing are also fantastic. It's impressive what they were able to do so long ago. It's as well probably the, has the most to say out of every horror film I've seen. The idea that not everyone is one-sided, everyone has different sides to them. Of course, not to this extent, but in a way it seemed like that was what the film was going for. This is another film on this list that even with age, still holds up. Number Four, Fight Club. Yeah, another well-loved classic on here, which probably means you already know why I love this, but I will try to somewhat express my feelings towards Fight Club. It's definitely a unique, but in an odd way, accurate take on masculinity. It's sort of a celebration of it, as weird as that sounds. Of course, it isn't nearly as exaggerated as this film, but in an odd way, it's also accurate. Brad Pitt and Edward Norton really give great performances you really buy. They do a great job of acting like polar opposites. Some people say the cinematography is dated, but I personally think to this day it mostly holds up. It has this raw venture feel that I love. It's also just so fun. I'm surprised how entertained I was by this film. While it definitely has a lot of flaws, overall, all, it's a great fun time that has interesting ideas. Number three, The Shawshank Redemption. Guys, I've talked about this movie too many times to really count. I know I haven't done a video essay on it yet, but I'll, I'll do that eventually. It's just, I don't want to talk about it again. You guys know why I love it. If you don't, then like go check out my other videos or whatever. Like, I've, I've talked about this movie so many times. I don't think I need to talk about it again. Number two, It's Such a Beautiful Day. This is honestly the most overlooked film I've ever seen. Almost nobody talks about it. The only reason I know this film exists is because I saw it on Dominic Talks Movies Favorite Movies list and I decided that I wanted to watch it. Now for everyone that wants to watch it, it's on Look Movie for free. Just go right there and watch it, I highly recommend it, but talking about the movie. This is one of the most creative things I've ever seen. The way the story is told is with a narrator's voice, and our main character is a stick figure that doesn't talk, which sounds on paper like a terrible idea, but the way it's executed is brilliant. The narrator says a ton of random things like how they would pop in your head at random, kind of making us feel like we're in the main character's mind. Without Bill even talking, we can feel exactly what he's feeling during the film, which is done with great imagery added with the narration, which doesn't sound like something that would, it, that would work, but it does. It's very humorous as well, which I didn't catch on my first viewing, which it isn't on the nose at all. If anything, it's very subtle about it. Bill, while not saying anything, is also a very relatable character. He's just a normal person like us. He's afraid of death and as he gets older, wishes life was back when things were simple. Like I said in my letterbox review, this film shows us life, how we look at it, and what it becomes when we reach the end point of it. It's shocking this film is more profound, powerful, and meaningful than films double its runtime. Number 1. The Perks of Being a Wallflower now, I have a video essay on this film. If you want to know my full thoughts, check that out. But one of the main reasons of this film is that there are multiple different messages. I mean, you can, you can interpret it in multiple ways, which I find very interesting. Which, again, check out my essay on this film. But overall, this is an emotional, heartfelt, and powerful movie that I love to death. Uh, hey everyone, so if you like this video, you know, like, make sure to like and subscribe and share it and all that stuff or whatever. This video took a long time to make, this took me hours to make, so I'd really love it if this would be very successful. Uh, yeah, that's gonna be it for the video. Of course, I don't want to beg for views if it does bad, you know, like, whatever, but, like, I'd really, you know, I'd, I'd like some of that, you know, because of this, this took me a long time to make. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.